Barry Cunliffe, The Ancient Celt, 2nd edition, 2018, chapter 3 in the beginning, 5500 to 1300 BC. The first recorded use of the name Celts is by the Greek geographer Hecateus, writing in the 6th century BC. Since then, the word has acquired a variety of meanings, leading to considerable confusion. For the purposes of this book, a Celt will be considered to be a person who spoke the Celtic language. This may sound straightforward, but not so. For many people in the past may have spoken more than a single language. One in their immediate community and another for communication with more distant neighbours. If Celtic was the language of the family, then they might reasonably be regarded as Celts, but if they used Celtic only as a lingua franca to facilitate external interactions, then should they be called Celts? Probably not. Exogamous marriage will also have added to the mix of languages spoken in any one area. Even more complex is what happens to language at times of migration. It is highly probable the Celtic hordes who attacked Delphi in 279 BC, some of whom went on to settle in Asia Minor, included peoples of different ethnic origin, speaking different languages, that they owed allegiance to Celtic tribal leaders and probably used Celtic as the language of command, would have suggested to contemporary observers a greater ethnic unity than in reality there was. These are complex issues of the kind with which we are familiar in our modern globalised lives, but such subtle distinctions are difficult to identify. When dealing with the more distant past, thus while the simple contention that a Celt is one who normally spoke Celtic is far from perfect, it offers a workable generalisation. Then the question arises, what is the Celtic language? As we saw in the last chapter, the antiquarian Edward Lloyd, working at the turn of the 18th century, had recognised the similarity between a number of contemporary languages spoken in the extreme west of Europe, in Brittany, Cornwall, Wales, Scotland and Ireland, and decided to call them Celtic. He could equally have chosen to classify them as Atlantean or language group A, but he chose the term Celtic to stress the ethnic and historical difference he believed there to be between the people of these remote Atlantic regions and the English and French, and because he was aware that archaic forms of these languages had been spoken in France before the Roman conquest, when the indigenous population was referred to by classical writers as Celts or Gauls. Lloyd's usage has proved to be resilient and is now widely accepted. The most thorough attempt to explore the extent of spoken Celtic is Patrick Sims Williams' detailed research on ancient place names in Europe and Asia, published in 2006. It presents a set of data which later replotted in a trend surface map by Stephen Oppenheimer, shows that surviving Celtic place names are concentrated in Ireland, Britain, France and Iberia, with less dense occurrences extending eastwards through the centre of Europe and around the Black Sea and cropping up again in Asia Minor. The eastern distribution neatly demonstrates the southern and eastern migrations of Celts, recorded by classical writers at their height between 400 and 200 BC. But it is the very strong Western concentration that stands out. Taken at its face value, the map seems to imply that the heart of Celtic speaking Celtic lay in the West, in the Atlantic zone. It should, however, be remembered that the data is achronic, reflecting the situation across many centuries and it includes only those names which have survived the vicissitudes of later history.
just reaching for the dictionary there. Vicissitude. What does that mean? Vicissitudes, changes of circumstances or fortune. That said, there is no reason to suppose that it is not a fair representation of the region in which Celtic was most frequently spoken. Since the original mapping was done, the detailed work of John Koch on the inscriptions found in the extreme southwestern corner of Iberia has shown that Celtic was the indigenous language spoken in this region and has added further data to the map. More to the point, it has shown that Celtic was being spoken in the region in the 7th century BC and quite possibly at least as early as the 8th century. Inscriptions from the Lapontic region of northern Italy take the use of Celtic in that part of Europe to at least as early as the 6th century. This evidence for the early use of the Celtic language clearly clears away once and for all the old misconceptions that Celtic spread to Western Europe in the Latin period or for that matter in late Halstatt times, Halstatt C and D. It was already a vibrant language, at least in the Atlantic zone, in the Late Bronze Age. Since there are no extant Celtic texts earlier than the 8th century and no mention of Celts in the historical record before the 6th century, the question of Celtic origins must be explored using other data. The arrival of the Indo-European languages. Celtic is an Indo-European language. It can only have developed, therefore, after the spread of Indo-European speakers to Europe. When and by which routes this spread took place is a hotly debated topic. There are currently two plausible models in play, the Kurgan hypothesis and the Anatolian hypothesis. Other suggestions proposing an introduction in the later Paleolithic period have not found much favour. The Kurgan model first put forward at the end of the 19th century, has for long been the traditional view. It proposes that Indo-European was introduced by horse-riding nomads from the Pontic Caspian steppe in the later Neolithic or Bronze Age, impacting on the Carpathian region, and then spreading from there to the rest of Europe. The Anatolian model, first presented in the late 1980s, argues that the Indo-European languages spread to Europe much earlier with the first farmers in a complex of movements emanating from Anatolia. The process began around 7000 BC and by 5500 BC the Neolithic way of life had reached the Atlantic coast. Both hypotheses have arguments in favour, in their favour, and as we will see later, they may not be mutually exclusive. The Anatolian model is favoured by several phylogenetic studies of the development of Indo-European. They support the date between 8000 and 6000 BC for the introduction of the language group into Europe and allow that Indo-European may have been spoken on the Atlantic coast before 4000 BC. These dates fit well with what is known of the spread of the Neolithic way of life throughout Europe. The rapidly growing corpus of archaeological data shows that once Neolithic communities had established themselves in Greece around 7000 BC, westward expansion was surprisingly fast. One route, via the Balkans and the Carpathian Basin, led to the river systems of Middle Europe and thence westward to reach the Atlantic coast of northwestern France, about 5300 BC. The second route was by seaborne enclave colonisation through the Mediterranean, reaching the Atlantic coast of Portugal between 5500 and 5400 BC. There were also inland penetrations from the Mediterranean coast to France, 
one via the Rhone Valley northwards, the other via the Haute Garonne valleys to the Atlantic coast of France. The Middle European route was characterised by cultures using linear decorated pottery, linear band karak, while the communities of the Mediterranean route favoured impressed or cardial decorated pottery. The successful spread of the Neolithic way of life across Europe involved the transfer of a complex knowledge base necessary to maintain stable systems of domestication and cultivation through a huge territory over a comparatively short space of time. It would not be at all surprising if the success of this model was l largely due to the sharing of a common language. If the spread of food production was the vector by which Indo-Europeans spread to Europe, it would go some way to explaining why the Mediterranean languages, Greek, Italian and Celtic, shared more in common than the Northern European languages of the Germanic Slavic groups, since they were introduced by geographically separate systems of, adva of advance over a period of 1500 years or more, allowing ample time for divergent development. In the Anatolian model, Indo-European speakers would have been established along much of the Atlantic coast of Iberia and the Atlantic and Channel coasts of France by 5000 BC. The Atlantic Community The coastal waters of Atlantic Europe provided an interconnecting network of seaways, encouraging connectivity along the entire Atlantic coast from Morocco to the Shetland Isles. That said, it is unlikely that many long haul journeys took place in prehistoric times, but short haul sea journeys between neighbouring coastal communities are likely to have been frequent since the sea was a safer and quicker mode of communication than travel over land. Fishing trips too would have encouraged exploration. Over time, the aggregate of these journeys was to create a maritime network through which commodities and ideas travelled and were shared. There is little direct evidence for when seafaring began in the Atlantic, but the coastal zone may well have formed one of the principal routes along which hunter-gatherers moved northwards during the period of climatic improvement following the end of the Ice Age. The cardio ware farmers who first appeared on the Portuguese coast in the last centuries of the 6th millennium were able sailors and would have found themselves among indigenous hunter-gatherers who were well used to the sea. There is ample archaeological evidence to show that the Atlantic coastal networks flourished in the period 5500 to, 40, 5500 to 4000 BC. The Channel Islands were be being colonised by farming communities around 5200 BC and seafarers were carrying domesticated animals, alive or as joints of meat, from Armorica to Ireland by the end of the 5th millennium. The intensity of connectivity along the Atlantic seaways is clearly reflected in the later development of collective tombs known as passage graves. The type seems to have its origin in Portugal, about 4800 BC, and spread quickly to Brittany, thence to the Irish Sea region of Britain and Ireland, reaching as far north as Orkney before the end of the fourth millennium. The architecture of these tombs with chambers reached by long passages, the burial rituals involved, the art styles sometimes employed and the cosmology implied by the alignment of some of the tombs with solar activity at the time of the solstices suggest that these disparate communities from Iberia to the north, far north of Britain were sharing a complex belief system. I there is no need to suppose that the ideas were spread by megalithic missionaries, as was once colourfully suggested. Hmm, interesting.
<laughs> but at the very least, the beliefs, knowledge, and technical skills implied by the spread of passage graves suggest a developed and consistent connectivity along the seaways. Given the complexity of the ideas that had to be communicated, it is not unreasonable to suppose that people had developed a common language, a lingua franca, that enabled the disparate groups to establish social bonds and engage in reciprocal exchanges, including the exchange of abstract ideas. If we are correct in accepting the hypothesis that the early farmers brought the Indo-European language to the Atlantic coast via both the Mediterranean and the Middle European river systems, then the Atlantic lingua franca is likely to have been developed from Indo-European roots. There would be nothing unusual about the emergence of a lingua franca that fostered communication along the Atlantic seaways. Similar languages have developed in other parts of the world to facilitate maritime connectivity. Swahili came into being along the east coast of Africa after the intensification of trade caused by Arab contact, and Malay developed to link the many isolated communities of the Malay archipelago an early Atlantic lingua franca could have been the base from which Celtic developed. If this is so, then the Celtic language originated in the same maritime region in which it is known to have been widely spoken by the first millennium BC. There is pleasing simplicity in this hypothesis. The connectivity established in the Atlantic zone in the period 5500 to 2800 BC played an important role in the next stage of development when there appears to have been an escalating mobility both of goods and of people. This phase, referred to as the beaker phenomenon, is characterised by the appearance of a distinctive type of pottery beaker, usually associated with a recurring set of grave goods including knives and archery equipment. In many areas of Western Europe, these grave sets are associated with individual burials, but along the Atlantic zone, beaker burials are found in existing collective tombs. The earliest form of beaker, a highly distinctive form known as the maritime bell beaker, first appears in the copper-using communities of the Tagus region of Portugal, around 2800 to 2700 BC, and the type quickly spread to many parts of Western Europe, where analysis of the pottery fabric has taken place. It can usually be shown that local clays were used, a fact which shows that it was the concept of the vessel that was transmitted rather than the pots themselves. I'm going to pause there. I see what he's done because people say, oh, it was pots, pots don't equal people is an archaeological maxim. The A certain pot, a, a, an Irish pot in Britain wouldn't mean that Irish were in Britain, for example. But uh, what Cunliffe has done here is played on that. He's said that the idea spread, not the people. Not Sorry, said that the idea spread, not the pots. And he's not said anything about the people. This is a, uh, this is a, a joke which inquires a, 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 an incredible lot of um, learning behind it. To see his his uh, this is this is a stab in the heart for many archaeologists, even if it doesn't make any sense to the general reader. He's re being really insulting here, even though it comes across as just standard narrative. Good on you, Mr. Kunliff. Professor Kunliff, I should say. Anyway, sorry for this wee rant. I'll get back on with business. Where were we? <laughs>
The earliest form of beaker, a highly distinctive form known as maritime bell beaker, first appears in the copper-using communities of the Tagus region of Portugal around 2800 to 2700 BC, and the type quickly spread to many parts of Western Europe. Where analysis of the pottery fabric has taken place, it can usually be shown that local clays were used, a fact which shows that it was the concept of the vessel that was transmitted rather than the pots themselves. With that idea went many of the beliefs and values associated with the very specific set of artefacts often associated with the beakers. The rapid spread of the beaker phenomenon across Western Europe is remarkable. From the Atlantic homeland in Portugal, the value system spread into the Mediterranean, especially to South East Iberia and to the Gulf de Leon and along the Atlantic to Brittany, Britain and Ireland. It also penetrated inland along the European river systems. What drove the new mobility is difficult to say, but one factor, possibly the prime cause, was the quest for metals. The Tagus communities, Tagus is a region in Portugal, the Tagus communities were experienced in copper production and their skills in working sulfur senide ores were introduced into southern France, Brittany and Ireland together with the maritime bell beaker package. It is difficult to resist the conclusion that prospecting for metal was one of the driving forces behind the new mobility. Alongside the mining of copper, gold sources were also exploited, and it was not long before tin was being extracted and the earliest bronze, an alloy of copper and tin, was produced. It is not entirely clear where exactly this technological breakthrough occurred in Western Europe, but the earliest regular tin bronze was first made in the Atlantic region, sometime about 2100 BC, in the metal-rich arc that included Brittany, southwestern Britain and southern Ireland. But it was not only metals that were being sought. Other luxury commodities such as jet and amber were now being exchanged on a greatly increased scale. Alongside the mobility of materials, we can begin to glimpse an enhanced mobility among people. The analysis of stable isotopes preserved in teeth offers a way of estimating how far an individual may have moved between early childhood and death. Studies in Germany and Britain show that a surprising percentage of the population had been mobile, though usually not over long distances. There are, however, exceptions. The coppersmith buried about 2000 BC at Amesbury, near Stonehenge, had probably spent his childhood in the Western Alps. Stop, I've got to stop there. Um, that's not, uh, probably. He could have come from Scotland. It, it, basically, the strontium... Um, isotope results of that scientific process, the results link the strontium levels to strontium levels in the geology of the area which a person was brought up because that only affects your teeth whilst they're rooting. And if you map out areas with that um, with that geolo geological level of strontium. There are some in Britain, in round about Argyll, I believe. As Kroonliff has said, there's some in the Alps, and because it, the Amesbury Archer uh, had that level, they're giving him this exotic origin in the Alps. Maybe he did come from the Alps, I don't know. But this is, uh, you know, being quite liberal with the with what's being found here from the from the strontium isotope levels. Not that, you know, let's not get ahead of ourselves. 
Um, I think that he people said he came from the Alps because they want to. It, it because because of the whole debate about well where were the bell peaker origins, and the two major hypotheses for that are um, Portugal, or at least Iberia or Holland in the Low Countries, and this is just an, another minor hypothesis there. Just as there's a Moroccan origin, but uh, for reasons I won't get into just now, the Iberian one is by far the strongest. So the Amesbury Arch doesn't really have anything to do with that, but hey ho. We'll get back with the book full, and I'll let you off this time, Professor Kunlif. But don't let it happen again. There are, however, exceptions. The coppersmith buried about 2000 BC at Amesbury, near Stonehenge, had probably spent his childhood in the Western Alps. Clearly, people were on the move. And even if much of the mobility was of limited extent, over the half of a millennium of the Bell Beaker period, 2700 to 2200 BC, the cumulative effect would have been considerable. By the end of this period, Bell Beaker enclaves had reached as far east as Hungary. But the distribution of the phenomenon is uneven, and although dense, Bell Beaker clusters occur across Western Europe, generally focused on the major river valleys. Indigenous cultures continued to exist over large areas. The evidence would be consistent with the hypothesis that there were movements of people eastwards over Europe, carrying with them belief systems and values emanating ultimately from the Atlantic Maritime Zone. The picture is still ill-focused and highly complex, but work at present underway on the ancient DNA of beaker populations will help to clarify the intricacies of the situation. Thus it would seem that following the period during which networks of connectivity were established along the entire Atlantic zone, 5500 to 2800 BC, there was a period of intensifying mobility, 2800 to 2021 BC, driven, at least in part, by the quest for metals and other luxury commodities, which saw the spread of the Bell Beaker cultural values across Western Europe. If the beginnings of Celtic as a lingua franca lay in the earlier period, then the eastward spread of Bell Beaker culture could be the vector by which the Celtic language spread across much of Western Europe. The fact that the extent of the Bell Beaker phenomenon in the late 3rd millennium BC is largely coincident with the known extent of Celtic place names by the late 1st millennium BC, maybe no coincidence. That said, the picture is likely to be more complex, as we will see. People from the steppe, as already discussed earlier in this chapter, the Kurgan model for the spread of Indo-European languages into Europe argues that the language is introduced by nomadic peoples moving westwards from the Pontic Caspian steppe. One such early moment can be recognised archaeologically and is classified as the late Yamnia culture. The incomers moving west out of their steppe homeland around 2800 BC settled along the western shores of the Black Sea along the lower Danube Valley and across the expanse of the great Hungarian plain. Attracted by the vast areas of lush open grassland, the archaeological evidence for the incursion finds strong support from recent ancient DNA studies, which have identified the steppe gene spreading across eastern and northeastern Europe at this time. The influx of new people brought with it well-trained riding horses, and the technology of vehicle building and was a formative influence on the indigenous single grave slash corded wear culture of the North from European plane. <laughs>
with the bell beaker communities expanding rapidly across Western Europe from the Atlantic zone eastwards and the steppe pastoralists moving westwards into Central and Northern Europe. In middle centuries of the third millennium, 2800 to 2200 BC, were a time of greatly increased mobility. The true complexity of the situation has still to be worked out, but certain things are already clear. Perhaps most important for the present discussion is the emergence of a zone of interaction between the bell beaker communities and the single grave slash corded ware culture, particularly focused in particular on the Rhine corridor. It was here that elements from the two cultural traditions merged. People from the steppe. As already discussed earlier in this chapter, the Kurgan model for the spread of Indo-European languages into Europe argues that the language was introduced by nomadic peoples moving westwards from the Punic Caspian steppe. One such early moment can be recognised archaeologically and is classified as the late Yamnaya culture. The incomers moving west out of their steppe homeland around 2800 BC settled along the western shores of the Black Sea, along the lower Danube Valley and across the expanse of the Great Hungarian Plain, attracted by the vast areas of lush open grassland. The archaeological evidence for the incursion finds strong support from recent ancient TNA studies, which have identified the steppe gene spreading across eastern and northeastern Europe at this time. The influx of new people brought with it well-trained riding horses and the technology of vehicle building, and was a formative influence on the indigenous single grave dash corded ware culture of North European Plain. With the Bell Beaker communities expanding rapidly across Western Europe from the Atlantic zone eastwards and the steppe pastoralists moving westwards into Central and Northern Europe in middle centuries of the third millennium, 2800 to 2200 BC, were a time of greatly increased mobility. The true complexity of the situation is still to be worked out, but certain things are already clear. Perhaps the most important for the present discussion is the emergence of a zone of interaction between the Bell Beaker communities and the single grave or corded ware culture. Focused in particular on the Rhine Corridor, it was here that elements from the two cultural traditions merged. Something of the mobility of the time is demonstrated by the network of connectivity which was established across northern France, linking up southern Brittany via the Loire, to the Gatanus, to the Seine Valley, and from there to the Lower Rhine. The river system played an important part in the networks, were already active in the preceding millennium, as the distribution of stone axes clearly demonstrates. It was probably along this route that maritime bell beakers reached the Lower Rhine Valley, about 2700 to 2500 BC and the route facilitated the distribution of the much sought-after honey-coloured Grand Persigny flint mined in the vicinity of Poitiers. Amber from the coast of Jutland was exchanged in the opposite direction. Already, by 3000 BC, the Lower Rhine region had adopted a single burial rite in which the inhumations were accompanied by a beaker decorated with cord impressions and quite often with a perforated stone battle axe. The right characteristic of the single grave or corded ware culture of the North European Plain. The arrival of the maritime bell beaker ensemble from the West initiated a period of borrowing and experimentation, and it was during this time that the single burial rite and the shaft hole axis spread westwards across much of France to the Atlantic coast and into Britain. All this is clearly displayed in the archaeological record. Those who favour the Kurgan hypothesis argue that it was probably in the phase of intense mobility in the middle centuries of the third millennium that the Indo-European language was first introduced into Europe and that it was probably somewhere in West Central Europe and that the Celtic language gradually emerged. They support their arguments by saying that certain words in Celtic, such as those associated with horses and wheeled vehicles, cannot have arrived before this time since horses and carts are not known in the early Neolithic of the cardial ware or linear band ceramic cultures. The Kurgan hypothesis, however, can only explain the extensive, the extensive use of the Celtic language in Iberia 
by positing a Bronze Age introduction for which there is no convincing archaeological evidence. It is also at odds with the phylogenetic studies which suggest the emergence of Celtic by 4000 BC. Pause, that's all wrong, that's really flawed, look into Perl and Lewis book. The Kurgan and Anatolian hypothesis each have their enthusiastic supporters. The arguments, both archaeological and linguistic, are as complex as they are ingenious. But an impartial observer might reasonably feel that neither side has furnished conclusive proof of their case. Is there a compromise? A possible compromise worth considering is that both hypotheses may in part be true, with a first wave of Indo-European speakers arriving with the first farmers from Anatolia and spreading through the Mediterranean and Middle Europe, and a second wave reaching Europe from the steppe several millennia later. In such a scenario, it could be argued that the Atlantic lingua franca spreading into Western Europe in the first half of the third millennium was refreshed and extended during the period of intense mobility in the middle centuries of that millennium that it was in Atlantic Europe, bound by active systems linking the entire maritime interface. The Celtic language crystallised out its continuing function as a lingua franca, ensuring that it did not, at this stage, fragment into incomprehensible dialects. This compromise takes with it the assumption of linguistic links between Anatolia and the Pontic Caspian steppe region, requiring that they both spoke Indo European. That such a link may indeed have occurred is suggested by recent ancient DNA results, which demonstrate a movement of people from Anatolia to the steppe in the late 4th millennium. While by no means proving that Indo European reached the steppe at this time, it offers a mechanism by which it could have happened. These are deeply fascinating issues which get to the very heart of our perception of prehistory. They require archaeologists, linguists and geneticists to work closely together to try to understand the strengths and limitations of each other's disciplines, data and interpretations, and especially to acknowledge the limitations. Perhaps it is too optimistic to expect the archaeological and linguistic data to be capable of being brought together into a coherent story. But the attempt is worth worth while. It may, however, be that this will require historical linguists to abandon the simplistic tree approach to the ordering of the Indo-European languages and to give more attention to the impact of processes of convergence and divergence, especially in regions like the Atlantic Maritime Zone, where there is ample archaeological evidence of connectivity over a very long period of time. Nor can the possibility of multiple incursions of Indo-European speakers into Europe easily be accommodated in the conventional tree model. Where we can expect real advances to be made is when ancient DNA data becomes available in sufficient quantity to be brought into juxtaposition with the archaeological evidence, so as to create mutually supporting and quantifiable models of human mobility. Only then will we be able to address the question of the origin of Celtic with a greater degree of assurance. I'd say we've reached that position myself.